If there was any doubt, a Robert F. Kennedy Jr. run would shake up the 2024 presidential race. Recent polls likely cast away remaining skepticism about the insurgent candidate. He is polling very well among independent voters, with polls revealing he's actually ahead of President Biden and Donald Trump with the bloc, according to several polls. He's performing better than any independent or third-party candidate in a generation. More notably, RFK Jr. is winning over voters under the age of 45, according to polls by The New York Times, Siena College, and Quinnipiac University. The insurgent candidate proven to be a formidable fundraiser, raking in over $8.5 million in the third quarter, also evidence of his growing support. Should announce as well that Jill Stein uh, has said that her Green Party candidacy is a go. Last week, she's getting in for that race, which will also impact Biden's standing to some degree. Um, so we should talk about that. Jill Stein seeking the Green Party nomination. She was the nominee last time around. Cornell West is no longer in the Green, is spe specifically running for Green Party, is running as an independent. Well, so. Howie Hawkins was the Green Party candidate last time last around, time, but she was uh, 2016, yes. yes. Um, yeah, so because Cornell West is no longer running as the Green, the Green Party has to find an alternative candidate. It is Jill Stein. Um, it seems, frankly, like a strong choice. You can't deny that she has name recognition, in part because she has been um, the punching bag of liberals who uh, refuse to interrogate any uh, of the ways the Democratic Party's own decision-making caused them to lose in 2016. She instead has been the um, bete noire of the party, and you can see this in coverage. Um, she is being referred to as a, flu f a fruit fly mm -hmm. that won't go away. Um, all of the ire from 2016 is still packaged and ready to go uh, at her, but it seems from these polls that the Democratic Party obviously has a much bigger problem here. The problem is that there is actually an appetite for an, any number of non-democratic candidates or, or non-democratic establishment candidates, I should say, some left-leaning people who are running on the Democratic ticket, like Marianne Williamson and Dean Phillips, some people who are running as independents, like Cornel West and Jane Huger. And then you have the, the main story here, which is RFK Jr., who is polling at something like 25 percent, right. a three-way matchup with Donald Trump and Joe Biden, who is doing very well with the very constituency group that tends to augur the outcome of these elections, independence. So we haven't had a poll result this favorable for a independent third party candidate um, who's actually in the race since Ross Perot, who similarly polled 20-21% um, and then did ultimately end up with 19% of the vote. I was just reading this CNN article to remind me of the exact numbers. Um, so he's joining a pretty, uh, RFK Jr. has already joined a very um, small club of candidates who have polled this well uh, without being Republican or Democrat. Um, you know, if you look at the—I mean, his, his impact right now is, frankly, is to eat into Trump's support a little bit. These polls in the swing states, when you have RFK Jr. not in them, um, Trump is ahead, well ahead. And then when you put RFK Jr. in, he's not ahead in all of them anymore. He's just ahead in a couple. Um, it, uh, it, it, it seems that— I mean, this, this, it's unsurprising. You have both major party nominees, assuming it will be Biden and Trump, incredibly unpopular in their own parties. They're unpopular generally, and their own voters, uh, a substantial block of them, want there to be someone else. A lot of Democrats think Joe Biden is too old and would prefer a different candidate. A um, lot of Trump vote, uh, Republican voters have soured on Trump. Obviously, he also still has a very loud and vocal um, group of people who, you know, we've seen his poll number. There are, in the Republican side, actually alternative candidates, and he's easily crushing them, so I don't mean to <laughs> don't mistake me for saying that the entire GOP is ready to turn on Trump or something like that. That's clearly not happening. But there's enough of an un unpopularity, even for their voters, and then certainly with the general election, that people are interested in another choice, and they're going to have one. They're going to have one. It's RFK Jr. Yeah, I mean, I, it will be interesting to see uh, how Republicans start to respond to RFK Jr. going forward. Oh, you're already more seeing more it. They're it eating. I'm people who were very supportive of him when he was mainly aimed at Joe Biden have have really um, started to remind people of what he said about the NRA in the past, what he said about um, uh, people who uh, he disagrees with on climate change. Um, although you know the, the the history of very non 
conservative political views that he's had. Mm -hmm. uh, Glenn, Glenn Greenwald pointed out that there is a response coming from the establishment wing of the Republican Party. You have a massive amount of money apparently going to into Nikki Haley's campaign. She's launching a $10 million ad campaign in a bid to overtake Ron DeSantis and present a uh, an establishment alternative to all of these candidates that seem to be leading right now. And we do see a interest in her coming out of the debates routinely. Um, people polled afterward think that she did very well, are pleasantly surprised by her performance. And there still is an important chunk of the American public, in addition to the overwhelming majority of the um, establishment uh, blob, that very much wants there to be someone who's going to safeguard things like our consistent aid to Israel and other allies over, uh, overseas. Glenn Greenwald says that her announcing this ad campaign is is basically a, a call, a, a bad signal to all of the establishment actors to say, invest in her if you want a return to normal, return to the status quo. Donald Trump, despite being the leading candidate, isn't quite offering that kind of surety mm -hmm. um, to the Republican establishment. What happens, though, when you have multiple people laying claim to this anti-establishment lane, none of whom is doing it perfectly? RFK Jr. has gotten a lot of flack for in seeming to endorse, a, we talked about this last week, uh, some of the college censorship that's been going on. Columbia University last Friday banned two uh, pro-Palestine student ju group, including Jewish Voices for Peace, the leading Jewish advocacy group that put together that really um, enormous event at Grand Central Station a couple of weeks ago that shut it all down, and subsequently that event uh, at the um, Statue of Liberty. You know, that is such a huge issue in the same way that COVID was a, a mobilizing issue for a lot of his supporters. So is uh, so are these free speech issues. And I do wonder how stable his support is going to be as he starts to take more establishment positions that historically candidates have had to take if they want to win the White House. Yeah, Nikki Haley certainly has conventional or establishment um, foreign policy views. You know, if you've watched her speaking for five seconds at any of the debates, that comes across a reminder that she is a, a neoconservative. Um, she supports not just continued aid to Israel, but also trying to still trying to win the war in Ukraine. Um, you know, that's her main point of difference with uh, Vivek Ramaswamy and Ron DeSantis. Um, she she does, you know, to her credit, even though I don't, her foreign policy is is not one I, I think Republican voters want at all. It's not one I particularly am enamored with, she does poll um, the best right now against Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. And even in the three-person matchup with RFK Jr. as well, it, it shows her, um, unlike the other Republicans, with the president, with RFK Jr. in the mix, she's still winning the election yeah. um, if she were the candidate and it would held today with those three. Yeah. And it, I, back to um, the left side of things, Cornell West, you know, some of the crit his um, critics were concerned that if he did leave the Demo uh, leave the um, Green Party uh, ticket, he would falter. Uh, the reason being that, unlike RFK Jr., he is not a beneficiary of millions of dollars of um, cash from rich donors. Uh, he got dinged, I think appropriately so, for accepting a relatively modest donation from Harlan Crow, but someone who absolutely is not ideological bedfellows with the kind of people who want to support Cornell West. And if you stay on the Green Party, then you do have much more in the way of already won ballot access in states across the country. Trying to go it alone as an independent without millions and millions of dollars to do the um, sign signature campaigns that are necessary to get on the ballot in 50 states, it's an incredible uphill battle. Uh, and it's making Jill Stein, in some respects, even if she's a less exciting candidate, simply because she's already run before and doesn't have the kind of broad reach of someone like Cornell West that's been in the public eye for so long, in the eyes of some progressives is seeming like the surer bet, simply because she's more likely just to be on the ballot. That concern mm -hmm. um, is certainly being shown and felt uh, in the mainstream media as people weigh on in her campaign. I think we have a clip of a conversation about Jill Stein's entrance into the race. Let's take a look. Jill Stein is uh, apparently running as well. She heard Hillary Clinton went back in 2016. You think that's going to be a major setback for Biden? Jill Stein, um, it's like a fruit fly that you can't get rid of, you know? Um, it could hurt Joe Biden. Now, again, even if she got 1% of the vote, that could also, you know, come against Joe Biden's coalition. The one thing I will say, though, is that with this potential six-person presidential race, we're in unprecedented times at this point. So 
we've been in unprecedented times with the potential nominee of Donald Trump and having felony convictions. So people are really going to have to figure out how to run races, to talk to voters, to talk to the issues. And even with everything as an uphill battle right now for the Senate for Democrats, after this week, with abortion being a leading issue, I still think there's an opportunity to go and talk to voters and really meet them where they are and Democrats pull it out. What do you think? Uh My concern is that instead of talking about ranked choice voting, which would, of course, mm -hmm. eliminate the spoiler effect, the status of Democratic Party insiders, the opinion of Democratic Party insiders seems to be to say the very existence of third party campaigns is a problem. And we want to work to suppress them no matter what. It didn't matter that the Libertarian Party got like three times as many votes as Jill Stein pulling from the right while yeah, Jill Stein pulled from the left. it was 1% versus 4%. It was ridiculous. To, so to the right. extent that you wanted to crush all of these independent parties, it would actually help Republicans have even more of an edge because their independent party is more successful than the left's right. independent right. party. And, but and anyway, the idea that all of the vote, that all of the Jill Stein voters, if not for Jill Stein, are voting for Hillary Clinton, or all of the, uh, act, frankly, it's even less clear on the uh, libertarian side mm -hmm. because some of those people would have voted for Donald Trump, some of them would have voted for uh, for Hillary Clinton because we're talking about 2016. Some of them would have not voted at all. Some of them would have penciled in Ron Paul, and and yeah. it, it, the idea that just claiming that one entire other coalition would get all those voters, and the same is true of Jill Stein. A lot of those people would yeah. not vote her. They'd write in someone they prefer. So, so it's already incorrect thinking to presume that all of the third-party independent voters automatically belong to one of the major two party candidates is such a that's a that's a that's like an ideological concession that uh, I'm not willing to make and you're sure. not willing to make and no one should be willing to make it's beloved by pundits and pollsters in the mainstream who like you know moving the moving the uh, the little the little beans around on the abacus and saying well if they got all these I mean you know it's, yeah. it's, it's, they, if, they love if Hillary had gotten uh, 60,000 more um, rural, working class, uh, Bernie-interested voters in Pennsylvania and, uh, and Michigan, uh, she would have been president. But she didn't. Sorry. 88,000 black voters in Wisconsin who came out and voted for Barack Obama in 2012 stayed home and did not choose to vote for Hillary Clinton. Well, Jill Stein made them do that. And that is just one state, right? And those were not, those 88, and her margin of uh, loss in that state was like 20 odd thousand. They were very so afraid of her, so they think had to about stay that. Home that day. Yeah, the blame game is much she was more uh, appealing than any kind of introspection, it seems. Stick around, we'll have a rising for you after this. <laughs>